Okay, let's go ahead and bring up the devices in question. I'm going to be using, as I said, simply two of my CSR routers. So that's going to be R1 and R2 for this purpose. So that's going to be CSR1, which is going to have a series of IP addresses on it. Show IP interface brief, exclude assigned addresses. We see those three addresses, so these are going to be the interfaces going down and across. And we also see the loopback address that I defined earlier. When we go in and take a look at CSR2, we'll say show IP OSPF, I'm sorry, show IP interface brief, exclude assigned addresses, and we'll see that we have a lot more interfaces. Now, one of the things I'm going to do is, I'm, again, like I said, begin simply. So my goal here is, is I'm going to go ahead and create a routing process, router OSPF1, and I'll go ahead and assign a router ID. And again, I do this simply to demonstrate the fact that the router ID is a dotted decimal format. It is not an IP address. So as you can see, this is not an IP address. It just so happens to be that IP addresses are dotted decimal in nature. Therefore, we take our router ID by default from the highest loopback and the subsequent rules that we discussed in class. So now with this being done, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and use the network command to advertise first my loopback interface. So I'm going to say 183.1.1.1. 0, 0, 0, 0, and I'm going to match it exactly. And as I said, I'm going to focus on area 1. So in this instance, there's not going to be an area 0 in this configuration. Now, another part of this is I'm going to want to advertise the physical connection. Now, what you'll notice here is I have two physical interfaces, 10.1.12.1 and 10.1.14.1. Those are the two main interfaces. And what I can do is I can advertise all of these at once, but right now the scenario is, is I really don't want to try to find a neighbor out of the G2 interface going towards R4. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be as specific as possible again. And anybody that knows me knows that this is my preferred method of doing things. It prevents me from accidentally advertising prefixes into the routing protocol as a result of uh, future tasks. If they say run a particular network or in a particular interface, that's exactly what I run and I use the <clears throat> the inverse mask of all zeros to match it exactly and again I'm going to advertise these into area zero. Now, what we need to do is find out first of all what interfaces are running in OSPF. So show IP OSPF interface brief should tell me what interfaces are running. And you'll notice here I have the loopback interface and I have gig one specifically, no other interfaces. It's also got to be noticed or pointed out that one of these interfaces is advertised as a loopback interface. That's its operational state. And the other is in a waiting state. Now, if I take a look at this interface, so I'm going to look at G0, sorry, I'm going to look at uh, gigabit one and I say show IP OSPF interface for G1, and we take a look at the configuration here, we see what we would expect. It is a Ethernet interface, therefore it should be a broadcast environment. We see the router ID that I defined. We see the associated cost for the link based on link speed, and we see the address that we're using to be able to form our relationships with and we can also see uh, a number of other things regarding the protocol, but right now this is going to be my primary focus. I do want to call out the intervals. So I have a hello interval of 10 seconds, a dead interval of 40 seconds, and we have a 40 second wait value. Now again, this, will, this goes back to the theory portion of our conversations. Now, I want to take the opportunity right now to pull out the sniffer. Now, before I do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say show IP OSPF neighbors. And I want to see if I have an adjacency. And we see that I do not. In fact, if I repeat the show IP OSPF interface brief command, we'll see here that on gigabit one, we've elected ourselves the designated router, but we see we have no neighbor adjacencies out of this link. Now, what I want to do, like I said, is I want to fire up the Wireshark configuration. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to R2 and I'm going to say capture and I want to look at the information that is being exchanged across gigabit one in Wireshark. Let's see what happens. Now again, I highly encourage everyone to take a look at this. Now at first blush, it doesn't look like there's anything going on at all. But if we're 
the least bit patient, what we're going to see is, is we'll see over here in the output that we're going to be receiving a periodic entry that is going to be coming from R1 out of interface G1 that is going to be used for the purposes of trying to detect a neighbor. Now that's the first thing that I want to take a look at. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take myself out of the equation here and what we're going to do is talk about this. Actually, I want to go the other way, but what we see here is, is that CSR1 is actually sending out a hello packet. Now as we discussed, the hello packet that we're sending out contains settings inside of it. And in order to form an adjacency, as part of this adjacency state machine, it has to be noted that some things need to be different. Router IDs must be unique. The area that we're using to form the adjacency must match. And later on when we start talking about OSPF um, network types like NSSA or stub areas or totally stubby areas, we're going to find out that certain parameters have to match, obviously. Now, as a direct part of this, what we're going to do is, is we need to understand exactly what's happening here. We have sent out this hello message, and this hello message is going to a specific address, and that destination address is 224.0.0.5. We're going to talk about the significance of these multicast addresses. And what we see here is it's actually being sourced from 10.1.12.1. And what I want to do is I want to take the opportunity to look inside of this hello packet. And what we're going to find here is, is based on the hello interval, which is 10 seconds, that's how often this process is actually going to refresh. So again, this is going to be definitely something that we need to pay attention to. And as we can see, exactly as I mentioned earlier, we have 10.1.12.1 as the source, the destination is 224.0.0.5. We see that it is indeed a hello packet, and it is isn't for the OSPF protocol. Now, what I want to do is I want to look at this payload. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click Open Shortest Path first, and it's going to tell me everything that we see here. It is a packet that is a hello packet, and it has a header. If I take a look at the header, we can see here it's actually coming from the device that has the router ID of 0001. We, if we scroll down just a little bit more here, what we're going to see here is information about the area, area one. We see information about authentication, which we haven't discussed yet, but we will. And what I want to do now is I want to turn my attention to the actual Hello Packet itself, the payload. And when we take a look at what's going on inside of the Hello Packet, we see that this Hello Packet is actually going out and trying to connect and form a neighbor, but I don't see a neighbor. I see here that I have a designated router of 10.1.12.1, so I promoted myself to the DR, and we see that there is no backup designated router. Now, that should stand to reason, and what we're going to do is we're going to just simply step back over to the light, the light board and walk through this process, because between these two devices, so between CSR1 and CSR2, we're connected like so. And what we've done is we've actually com configured and formulated and serialized a hello packet. And we've sent it across this link. And that hello packet has actually arrived on CSR2 gigabit 1. Now, CSR2 is not going to respond to this hello packet and you'll notice that there's no information being exchanged other than the hello. So there's no other packet types. We have hello packets that are being exchanged, and that's for the express purpose right now of adjacency state formation as part of the ASM. We also, later on, will find out that we're going to have link state updates, and we're going to have link state acknowledgments that are going to be sent back and forth as part of the peering process. And this is step one of this adjacency state mechanism. And what we're going to find here is, is if we look at the state of OSPF at this particular juncture, we are going to be what is referred to as the initializing state. Remember, in initializing state, we're trying to discover our neighbor. Now, when I come on and configure CSR2 such that CSR2 is going to be participating in OSPF. Now what I'm doing is I'm actually taking this interface and the loopback on CSR1 and I'm placing it inside of OSPF process 1 area 1 
And I'm going to do the same thing for this physical interface as well as for CSR2's loopback interface. Now that means that the moment that I do that, CSR2 should actually send its own hello packet. Now remember, the hello packet in this instance is going to be sourced from 10.1.12.2 and it's going to be going to a destination of 224.0.0.5 and this is taking place dynamically the moment that I turn this protocol on and again this constitutes my hello. Now inside of the hello packet remember I showed you that we had a router ID so as an example this device was 0001 and we should know that this device is 0002. Now what will happen is a CSR2 is going to send that hello packet out the link and it's going to arrive over here on CSR1 and as a part of the adjacency state machine I'm going to look at it because what we're going to find is, is this packet is actually an OSPF packet and the moment it arrives over here I need to take a critical look at it. Now what's going to end up happening is, is when I see his router ID what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to send or modify my hello packet so again it'll be sourced from me but what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to advertise his ID back to him. So I'm going to say I, I see a neighbor of 0.002, the acknowledging router. Now what will end up happening is, is when that arrives over here, this device as part of the adjacency state mechanism is going to see its own router ID in that header and it's going to tell me I have bidirectional communication. We denote that in OSPF by changing the transition from initializing to two-way. And then ultimately what we're going to do is we're going to enter another configuration. We're going to go initializing two-way then we'll go to the exchange start. Then we will go to exchange. Then we will go to loading. Then we'll transition to full. Now the problem with this is, is that from the sniffer's perspective, this is going to take place like that. But what I want to do is I want to observe the process slowly. So th think of this almost like time-lapse photos or a slow motion on the play when it comes to forming these neighbors. And it's all going to begin by going over here to CSR2 and enabling OSPF on it. And then we'll see the immediate response and process and what we'll do is we'll walk through that step by step. Now when we get into the configuration what we're going to find is, is that right now we still have this idea of a single unidirectional hello. So that's it's coming from 10.12.1 and going to the other devices. But we don't see anything coming from 2 going to CSR one, and that's because we've done no configuration on that device. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to modify that process. All I'm going to do right now is I'm going to come in here and say config T router OSPF1. Give it a router ID just because I can. And I'm going to say network 10.1.12.2 match exactly area 1 and what we're going to do is the moment I hit this, we should see some pretty significant changes taking place over here. Now, I'm going to go ahead and stop the trace because I don't want to move into the next phase. The next phase of this process is going to be what we refer to as the finite state machine. But I do want to take a critical look at each of these individual components. So the first thing that we see here is I am sending, I didn't mean to double click it, I am sending a hello from CSR1 going to CSR2. It is a hello message. Now if I again take a look at what's going on inside of this configuration here, notice it says I have a designated router, I have a no backup designated router, but what we see here is, is notice I am sending a particular piece of information called the active router and notice that that is 0002. So as I said, CSR1, which is the device in the configuration, let's see here, 
is this guy over here. He is sending his hello, and it is zero, zero, 001 when I take a look at the message coming over here from CSR1, we see that the designated router on that segment, but I do see an active neighbor of two. So this moves me into that two-way state that I was describing. Now, once we go into the two-way state, what we're going to do is, if we return to our theory, we're going to be focusing on the idea of beginning to exchange updates. Now, in order to be able to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to enter the exchange start phase. And that's where we're going to be electing the master and the slave, like we discussed in the theory, that is going to be responsible for sending and receiving what are referred to as database descriptors, DBDs. And we can see right here, this is my first database descriptor configuration. And notice it's being sourced from CSR2. Now, if we take a look at the configuration here, we notice, again, we've got our header information. So the source is 0002 in this instance. The configuration here is the area one. And if we take a look at it, we should see the OSPF database descriptors. And if I break this out and we scroll down and take a look at it, what we're gonna see is the contents for this configuration. So if we go down and look at the database description, for the configurations and let's see the option values. What we see here is the fact that, let me, let me download, let me uh, drag this down just a little bit so we can see more. There we go. So if we take a look at the output here, we can see these database descriptors. Now, I want to call your attention to this field right here, 1500. Now, in our theory, we did not talk about the MTU being one of the characteristics that we need to really pay attention to, but it has to be pointed out, and we'll discuss it when we get into the MTU configurations, that if you ever have a condition where you are stuck in the exchange start phase of the OSPF turnup, Nine times out of 10, that's going to be indicative of the fact that your MTUs are mismatched. Now, the rationale behind this is, is these database descriptors that we're going to be exchanging are going to be sized based on the maximum transmittable unit. So it's going to be in our best interest to ensure that this process actually matches. Now, then when we take a look at the configuration here, notice we have information coming from CSR1 going to CSR2. want to get into the actual um, config as far as these exchanges that are going back and forth. So we can see a number of these exchanges that are involving database descriptors. And the way I always tell everybody to think of a database descriptor, it's kind of like a crib note. It's like a cheat note. And inside of that note, what we have is we have the device saying, hey, this is a list of everything that I know. When it arrives on the other side, the other device looks at it and says, well, I know this one, I know that one, I know this one. And it makes a conscious decision to ask for the information that it doesn't know about. So whatever's not defined or if it has an entry in the database that it doesn't have, sorry, in the database descriptor that it doesn't have in its database, what it's going to do is it's going to actually request an update. And that's going to move us into the next portion of this process where we're going to talk about the LS requests and the LS updates. So the LS request is going to say, hey, I don't know about this specific prefix. I want you to send me some information pertaining to a specific prefix. And we'll look at the link state request in the configuration here. We see that the, the values are here. And the next information that goes out is going to be an update. Now you'll notice here that that's coming from one going to two after the request from two. And if we take a look at the contents of that update packet, what we're going to find here is, is that it's going to have one LSA. So it's a link state update that contains a single link state advertisement. And that advertisement is a type one LSA, a router LSA. And if we go ahead and we break this down a little bit further, what we'll also see is, is it's going to identify the actual networks. It's a single update. So a link state 
advertisement or a type one link state advertisement, a router LSA, is going to be a single advertisement that actually has a listing of every interface that is participating in OSPF or every route that is being learned from an OSPF neighbor. So as we go through and we take a look at the configurations here, it's going to be important for us to understand how this actually takes place. Another thing that I'd also like to call your attention to is the fact that there are a number of interface descriptions or states. As an example, we should have seen one in there that said stub. Now, from the perspective of OSPF, a stub means that it's going to be a network that doesn't lead anywhere, i.e. there are no other neighbors outside of that interface. If it is going to be a transit network, that means obviously that there are neighbors outside of that interface, irregardless of whether we're talking about loop inter loopback interfaces or whether we're talking about physical interfaces. Let me illustrate that process. So when we take a look at the configuration here, I'll, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back into R2. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to advertise, well, first of all, from the perspective of we were looking at the update from R1. So that's this update right here. And we can see that it's actually sending me information for three networks. It is sending me information for the IP network of uh, 10.1.12.0. And it's sending me information for, um, for 183.1.1.1. And we know that it's actually exchanging this information via our LSA. And that LSA is a type 1 LSA. Now, we'll talk about LSAs in the, in the next portion of the lecture. And it's going to be important for us to understand how LSAs work. But like I said, any interface that is participating in the protocol is actually going to be advertised as a result of these mechanisms that I'm describing. So really quickly, let me go in here to the config, and let me see, this, this update is coming from, let me just go ahead and close it, from 1. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to R1, and I'm going to advertise another interface. In fact, what I'll do is I'll say config t router OSPF1, and I'm going to say router or network 10.1.0.0, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to say any interface that satisfies the condition of the first octet is 10, the second octet is 1, and I don't care what any of the other two octets are, go ahead and advertise that into area 1. Now, if I take a look at this, that means now I should have picked up an additional interface. Do show IP OSPF interface brief, and we'll see here that now I am advertising another interface, which is going to be G2. Now, if I take a look at my updates as they come through, what used to only have two updates should now actually have three. So let's take a look and see what's going on here. And we see there's another link state update from one right here. And if we scroll all the way down to that configuration, we should see that it is going to define the other network. So one second here. I want to identify the network that is being advertised. So that's, an, that's going to be for, oh, I stopped it. I, I was going to say, that's the, not the right one. So here's what I'm going to do is I will go ahead and um, continue without saving. And what I'll do just to illustrate that process is go to interface. Actually, I'll interface G. To show IP interface brief, e assigned addresses, and interface G2. I'll shut that interface down, which should retract that prefix, which we see. And then what I'll do is I'll turn that prefix back on. So I'll say no shut. And let's see if it actually sends a new update. So there we go, link state update. All right, and let's see what we see here and see if it has anything to do with that address. So notice here, we're now advertising. This is still a type 1 LSA. So it says right here, type 1, router LSA type 1. But now what you're going to notice or you should notice is it's actually advertising the 10.1.14 in unison with the 12.1 and the loopback interface. So again, this is all part and parcel of making certain that we know how to interpret what's taking place across our links. 
Now there's also some other things that I can actually assume as a direct part of this process. And that is going to be, since I'm exchanging LSAs, that means I form neighbors. The other part of this is, is that my neighbor state should be full once everything has been exchanged. And keep in mind that those link state updates are acknowledged as part of this process. So with that being said, what we're going to do is we're going to stop right here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to come back and we're going to talk a little bit, a little bit more about these type 1 LSAs and some of the restrictions associated to their forwarding inside of the OSPF process. What we're going to find is this is actually going to be um, constrained to a given area, of which we only have one area right now. We have area one. And we don't need an area zero unless we have more than one area. So we'll hit those high points later on in our lesson. I'll see you there.